Keep your Bibles open to Romans. I set my glasses out to tell that story, and I couldn't find where I put them. So I'm looking, going all through the 26 pockets they put in a, a, a vest here. And just, anyway, turn to Romans chapter 5. There are some things that Jesus is quoted as saying that are very hard to either understand or to put into practice. One of the hardest things is to love your enemies, to do good to those who persecute you, or to turn the other cheek. Has anybody ever had that problem? Or am I by myself? No. Okay. I want you to think about this. In the experience of your life, have you ever really had an enemy? Someone that you would have considered an enemy? Yes? No? Good, Mary, that's because you're so sweet. I can never see you have an enemy. Who's had an enemy that's brave enough to raise their hand? Okay. Now, I want you to think about how much pain that enemy caused you and what your thoughts towards that person were, or amount of fear. Then I want you to think about what this text in Romans says. See, because no matter how bad the enemy is, that enemy can never do to you what we have done to God. The Bible says that the wages of sin is what? So is sin... Is sin something that we should be aware of? Is it something that we should avoid? When you look at a holy and righteous God who has never sinned, who cannot be in the presence of sin because what happens? What happens when God comes into the presence of sin? He becomes a consuming fire. Why? Because he loses all control? You need to understand God's holiness so you can contrast it to our sinfulness. Then I want you to understand what John 3.16 says. John 3.16 says what? Turn your Bibles to John 3.16. Open it up. Most of you know this by heart. I want you to understand how God sees us in our sinful state and what He has done for us in our sinful state. And I want you to understand that God was the aggressor in trying to bring us back into full fellowship with Him. So, John 3.16. Tom, you have that? Mm -hmm. Can you read it for me? For God said, Love the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, and that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So a couple of questions. It says, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that if you believe in Him, you should not perish. What would cause you to perish? Sin, right? The wages of sin is death. Jesus made a statement, and He said, I am the way the truth, and the life. Did he end that quotation there? What did he say after that? No one can come to the Father except through me. That sounds kind of narrow-minded. Sounds kind of um, exclusive. Look at all the religions in the world today. And you're telling me the only way to heaven is through Christ? Do you understand why? Well, go back to John 3.16. What does it say? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He didn't use sons as in plural. He didn't say, I gave my son here, and then I gave this over here and that over there. 
What did he say? He gave his only begotten son. Jesus said, I am the way. The way of what? The way of life. The way of truth. But most of all, the way of salvation. Now listen. Going back to the wages of sin. Jesus gave a parable about a man who owed so much money to his boss. And he could never repay his boss. Right? What did his boss do when his boss said, I want my money back? And the man said, I can't pay you back. But give me a chance and I'll do whatever I can and I will pay you back. What did the boss say? The boss said, I'll forgive all of your debt. All of it. Do you realize that when Adam and Eve disobeyed God just one time, they entailed a debt that they would never, ever be able to repay. They were helpless, hopeless, and in a state that they could never reconcile back to God. Do you guys understand that? Right? Sure? Because that's the gift that you got from them. That when you were born, because they disobeyed, and now your nature is a nature that has fallen and is a nature that disobeys, you too owe a debt to God that you'll never be able to repay. And the great thing is, is that God understands that. And God realizes there is nothing, no kind of good works, no kind of man-made obedience that you will ever do that will ever get you into a right standing with Him. So God took the initiative to bring us back to Him. This is why, as Christians, the Bible tells us we've been given the ministry of what? Reconciliation. Reconciliation. Do you guys understand what that means? Why do we have a ministry of reconciliation? Who are we reconciled first and foremost to? And because we're reconciled to God, we're also reconciled to each other. Okay? I want you to think about what God actually did when He reconciled us to Himself. Again, John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that He gave His Son. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Turn back to Romans now. And let's look at Romans chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. This is the demonstration of God's love. And this is the answer to all the questions about why there's evil in this world, why people have to suffer, why God doesn't answer my prayers the way I want Him to answer it. Why? Why? Just why? Before we get into this text, let me ask you another question. Does God have the right to set the punishment that He has on disobedience? Why? That sounds more like a dictator. Saying that God has the right just because He's God to people who don't know God sounds like a dictator. So, you have to know God and you have to understand sin and you have to understand what God's original plan was. When God created Adam and Eve and He created this world, when you go back to Genesis, was there flaws in the creation? Each day, God looked at it, and what did He say? It was good. And when He got to the last day, what did He say? Not only was it good, but it was very good. Now, God is holy. God is just. And God is righteous and perfect. But more than that, John tells us that God is love. And God does nothing out of this motive of love. So when God requires obedience from His creation, He does it 
out of love. And we should render obedience to God because of love. Do you guys understand that? So when Adam and Eve disobeyed, God had every right to bring the punishment upon them that he did. But let me ask you a question. God explained to them, and God told them, if you sin, and if you disobey, if you eat of the fruit of this tree, what's going to happen to you? You shall die. Right? Was he just using hyperbole? Was he just exaggerating, trying to get their attention? Did he mean what he said? Yes. Why was disobedience worthy of death? It was separation from the Holy God. All you have to do is look at your life experience today and look at the world and look at the pain and the suffering and the evil. And now you'll understand why God had every right to tell them, if you disobey me, you should die. Why? Because this, this, all that you see in our world today that's been going on from the fall of Adam to our day today, all the wickedness, all the strife, all the wars, all the evil is from one act of disobedience. Amen. You guys understand that? One act of disobedience. So is it a small thing to disobey God? Before we get to this text in Romans, God, it says, demonstrated his love by John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Now let me ask you a question. I want you to think about this. When Jesus came, the Son of God, God in the flesh. The Gospel of John says in John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the same was with God in the beginning. Then it goes on to say that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word became flesh. Now, when Jesus was born, did the world celebrate His birth? Did they come to Him and give Him the worship that He was due? Where was He born at? In a stable, in a manger, surrounded by what? Animals. When God declared his birth, who did he declare it to? Shepherds in a field. Now, in Jewish society back then, back then, in society itself, shepherds, were they on the top of the economic ladder? Where were they at? Was there, was there anything lower than the shepherd? What do you think about this? Who did the angels go to declare the birth of Jesus Christ? Now, when, oh, what is his name? He's the Prince of England and his wife, who's going to, going to be having the, the, the third baby. When, when, when they got married, did the world watch their wedding? When they birthed that first child, did the world watch and, and celebrate the birth of this child? When Jesus Christ came, did the world celebrate his birth? Who came to see him? A bunch of shepherds. And then you had some foreigners from a different country. At least they were kings. But there was only three of them. They came. God gave us his son. And what did the world do to his son? He grew up. And he started his ministry. And did the leaders of Israel accept their Messiah? Did they embrace him? No. <laughs> they hated him. And all they could think about was how they could kill him. And so they rejected him, gave him over to the Romans, and they put him on the cross, and he died. Let that go around in your mind. The Son of God comes to this world to save us, and what do we do? We crucify. 
Now, let's look at Romans. Chapter 5, verses 8 and onward. But God demonstrates His own... What's that word? But God demonstrates His own love towards who? Towards us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more, having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through Him. Verse 10. For when we were, what? Enemies. Who were we enemies with? Why were we God's enemies? Say it out, Ricky, because you're right. We were separated from Him because we sinned. Now, yeah. once you think about this text, it says that while we were enemies of God, who is that being spoken of? Just those people yeah. in yeah. Paul's day who he's writing to and those who came before? No. You understand? This is humanity. Amen. All humanity from the fall of Adam to when Christ comes back. Do you realize that We're all in Adam. <laughs> right? How many people did God use to populate the world? One. One. Actually, one. He started with Adam. Okay. And then he took Eve out of Adam. Think about what he's saying. Okay? So, from the first couple, were there any other humans or semi-humans or anything else that he created? Or did we all come from that one? So look around you. From Adam and Eve came us all. All the shades, all the colors, all the looks, yes. Uh, Acts 17, 26, and it says, And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. So from Adam, we all came from him. We are in Adam. And from Christ, we have the same opportunity to be in Christ. Now I want you to think about this. It says that God demonstrated His love that when we were still sinners, enemies of God. Why were we enemies? Because we were sinners. Even if we weren't born yet, is God able to see the beginning and the end? Yes. And does He see it all as one? Yes. So, in Adam, we have sin. In Christ, we have redemption. And God showed that love while we were enemies, estranged from God. He gave us His Son. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Do you understand that there was never a, a point in time when Adam sinned that God did not bring reconciliation to the human race? When God promised Adam and Eve that when you eat of this, you will die, why didn't they die? Because God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And it was only because of that that they had some type of hope that their children could have hope and their children and their children all the way to our generation. I want you to understand what kind of love that God has for you. Because God has done all of this. We did not have to do one bit of work to work our way and say, God, can you save me now? Amen. While I was an enemy of God's, and I want you to think about what I asked you. Have you ever had an enemy? Would you be willing to do something good for that enemy? At the height of their being a thorn in your side, really being your enemy, did you have good thoughts towards them? Were you thinking of their best interests? Do you realize that at your lowest and the deepest depth of your sin, God never had a bad thought about you? that all of God's thoughts were of reconciliation, of bringing you back and restoring you into His family. That was weak. Amen. Amen. Wow, that was weak. 
But God demonstrates His own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received that reconciliation. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men. Why? Because all have sinned. You guys understand verses 13, 14, 15? Let's skip down to 15. But the free gift is not like the offense, but if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. What is the gift that we get through Jesus Christ? Salvation. It's the gift of salvation and reconciliation. Right? Do you understand what that word reconciliation means? Say it loud. To be made right, just like the original. Is that correct? Is that right? I, I am asking you, Chuck. I don't have a dictionary, and I can only tell you what I think that word means. I love that definition. What it means to me to be reconciled to God is that all this junk that I've carried in the past does not hinder me from being His son. And that what God has done with, for me through Christ is not kept me a slave to that junk, that sin. But that He, through Christ, has made me into a new creation. Chuck. The word reconciliation comes from the Greek word katalasos, which means restored to divine favor. So Legally, that means that the human race, after the cross, now stands before God, as Adam and Eve did, before they sin. Wow. And that is exactly what you had said as well. This is why you should study the Greek. <laughs> Thank you. See, I have always said that God, through Christ and in Christ, looks at you as if you have never sinned. And that you are now restored, reconciled to Him, and He sees you in Christ perfection. The question is, is if we have Christ perfection, can we actually live in Christ perfection? Amen. As brothers and sisters, what I've been talking to you about the last few weeks is the delay. Do you want Jesus to come back? Yes. Amen. Do you really want Jesus to come back? Amen. Do you wish he came back already? Yes. The question is, is why hasn't he come back? It's your wish. It's your want. But there's been a delay, is that right? Mm -hmm. What has caused this delay? Us. Us. Well, listen, what I want you to see is how God loves you and what he's done for you. And that God doesn't want a delay. It's not part of God's plan to keep delaying this thing. Let me ask you a question. And I heard a man tell me this, and I've been thinking about this, thought it was really good. Who's, who's benefited the most by Christ's delay? Why? Because it continues to give him more time, is that right? Well, the state of execution. So, state of execution. So, if Satan can continue to keep God's people focused on other things that will continue to delay Christ's coming, doesn't it benefit him the most? Don't you think that's what he would continue to want to do? Now, I saw a thing on the internet um, yesterday morning that said, that these really wealthy people are spending up to $110 million to build these apocalyptic bunkers. <laughs> apocalyptic bunkers that will allow them to ride out the storm. That when it comes, 
They'll have all the food and the luxuries that they need. They have a show on TV called Doomsday Preppers. You've never seen it? Oh, my child. That's probably a good thing. Doomsday Preppers. You can also look and see that the nation, and not just the nation, but the world, is able to see that we're close, close, close to the end of all things. And the attention of the world is focused on this, this calamity that's going to take place. And they're wanting to know what to do. Do you know that when Christ was born the first time, Gary, I, I knocked that thing off, that little spongy thing? And I can't see to put it back on. I have it. I did find it. Okay. Do you know that when Christ came the first time, the world was anticipation, was in, in anticipation of something taking place? They were waiting for a Messiah, the Messiah. And right now, we're in that same place that the world knows something is going to take place. Something big is going to happen. Do you realize that over a century ago, a woman wrote in a book called The Great Controversy about this exact thing? That the world is looking and they don't know how to answer the perplexities of life. I bring you all of that to tell you that Satan is going to continue to keep blinding your eyes to what's important and keep you looking at issues that have nothing to do with the coming of Christ, but you think have everything to do with the coming of Christ. Did Jesus say when you see wars and you hear of rumors of wars, when you see pestilences, earthquakes, <laughs> And natural disasters. Did he say that's when my coming would be? What did he say those things would be? He said those were birth pains. Those have to happen. That's just the beginning of sorrows. What did Jesus say would be the sign of his coming? Days of Noah. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall be the coming of the Son of Man. But I heard somebody say it. When this gospel is preached to every nation, kindred, tribe, tongue, and people, then the end will come. As a witness. As a witness. What, is, what does that mean, Ricky? As a witness. You got time for another sermon? <laughs> <laughs> a witness. We are allowing him to create his character in us so that we can tell the story. So that he can tell the story through us. us. So now listen to what he just said. Because I left that last part out of purpose. Because that's what most of the churches are, if they're focused on that part, that's that part. Well, if we spread the gospel, if we can get the Bible in all these languages and take it to all the world, then Jesus will come. But who is to actually spread the gospel as a witness? You and I, it's Christ in me, the hope of glory, that the people no longer see me, but they see Christ yes. in me. I am the gospel message. You are the gospel message. And this is why the delay has happened. So, should we look and continue to focus on world events, what this nation does, what that nation does? Should we be worried about what the Islamic Religion is doing. What did Jesus say? What should our focus be? It should be on Him. And it should be on Him. And it should be on what? Him. All these things are going to happen. Don't put your focus on things that are just a sideshow. Because that's what the devil wants you to do to prolong his probation. What you should focus on is Christ living in me, the hope of glory. That I, with Christ in me, can overcome Satan 
and this world. Amen? Amen? Why has the delay happened? Because we're not willing to do that. We're more willing to look at what Russia is doing, what the Islamic nations are doing, and not look at what Christ can do in me. I heard... Uh,